No, this is John Miller. Uh, I'm very uh, happy to have a chance to host this panel on a very important topic around AI and disinformation. As uh, many of you may know, this year, 2024, is the year when the greatest number of people in the history of the world will vote. And it's over uh, half the population of the globe will have the chance to vote this year. It will also be the year that we probably see the most influence of disinformation and particularly AI-based disinformation and the potential impact that has on elections, um, certainly any time uh, that we've, uh, first is any time in history and, and probably just the beginning of, of how this will look in the future. So what I'd like to do today is uh, first spend a couple of minutes uh, introducing myself and then each of our panelists. We might uh, each uh, have a couple of words to say around uh, the particular focus of our work and then have an open discussion around this topic. So first, myself, I'm John Miller. I am formerly the CEO of AOL, which at the time was the largest online uh, news operation in the world. I went on to be the chief digital officer and chairman and CEO of the Digital Media Group at News Corp and Fox, when it was the largest commercial news operation. I've been a director of the BBC News. I've invested in numerous uh, startups in and around the news business, for example, including today, looking very much at, at, at AI-based uh, news operations. I've also, on the education side, I've been a longtime uh, advisor uh, to what was initially the edX project between Harvard and MIT, which brought the them online and, and was their online uh, university efforts and, and education efforts. And more recently, um, they split up uh, on the Harvard side and a director of Houghton Mifflin uh, in the United States, which is the largest uh, textbook uh, publisher for schools in the United States. So I have a history of being involved in and around the, what's called the news and information business and now very much focused on, um, on the impact of AI on all of this. So what I'd like to do is read you something and, and use this as a basis uh, to set up a bit of the discussion. So I'll, I'll, read, I'll read what I wrote. The deployment of AI poses significant disinformation threats that can impact societies in profound ways, from the creation of deep fakes to the manipulation of public sentiment. The challenges are substantial. Addressing these threats requires a concerted effort from governments, technology companies, and civil society to develop countermeasures and promote digital literacy amongst the public. So I think what's interesting about this statement, I actually think it's pretty true, um, is it was written, of course, as you may have already guessed, by an AI. Um, and it was in response to my question as, as to what were the major threats uh, around disinformation and AI and the deployment of AI. It actually gave a much lengthier answer in more detail around each of the topics that I touched upon in that in that summary that I that I just read to you. What's secondarily interesting about it is this was done by a company I have a relationship to I've been advising called Klee.ai. It's not one of the it's an early stage one. It's not one of the best known. In fact, it's funded by only uh, very early seed funding. This is not what you've been reading about, where literally billions of dollars have gone into some of the major. Uh, AI efforts that you may have heard about, such as uh, Open Open AI, Anthropic, etc., um, and shows just how rapidly the technology is developing. Again, this this was built by some very smart people, but for literally a few hundred thousand dollars, and it and it has the same levels or close to the same level of sophistication as some of the better known, uh, larger funded, much larger funded um, overall efforts that you hear from the big tech companies. And again, what it really just shows to me is how uh, incredibly quickly this area is developing um, and, and how widespread the deployment and the, uh, will be on a global basis. This was built uh, outside the United States, for example. So um, it's pretty good. Uh, as I said, it's only getting better very, very fast. And there's been some recent developments, even as, uh, as recently as yesterday, that hopefully we'll get a chance uh, to talk about. But I'd like to just use that as a, as a setup for both the actual uh, issues that we need to think about and how very much AI is at the forefront of it in, in, in both uh, recognizing the issues as, as well as be, being the issue. So with that, I'd, I'd like to introduce our next panelist, uh, Raza Aliyev. Hi, John. Hi, uh, fellow panelists and uh, fellow guests. Um, thank you for having me here. Thanks for World Academy of Arts and Science. I'm Raza Aliyev. I'm Senior Advisor um, for at Nizami Ganjavi International Center, which is a, a 
uh, a think tank and international organization. I'm a big partner of World Academy of Arts and Science, uh, which joins um, pro prominent leaders uh, across the world, current and former heads of states, and leaders in academia and business. Based, I'm originally from Azerbaijan, and I'm glad that uh, Johnny mentioned the AI being not purely kind of coming from the global north, let's say, and then it was great to have that company, yeah. to hear about a company which is non-US developed. So I'll touch upon that uh, in my remarks. And yeah, great to be here. I'm an ex-diplomat, uh, ex-banker, and currently I'm working on the intersection of the uh, kind of climate change, uh, sustainability, and technology. Perfect. A anything you would, you would want to say about uh, uh, the, the topic uh, as a general statement? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So just maybe one small remark. And I think, John, we'll have some time to kind of share our... our oh, absolutely. Um, yes. Just maybe one thing to, uh, to add to your point, John, is that, you know, uh, I think it's really when, when, when we speak to people and kind of read the media, especially when it comes to disinformation or, and the elections this year, uh, a lot of people focus on kind of the negative sides of the AI tools. You know, you mentioned the Gen.ai and the fake, deep, fake deep, deep videos, you know, sound images, imagery, misleading kind of content. But I think sometimes it's also good as we go through this panel to look at the positive sides as well that can happen, which is about enabling, for example, uh, political parties and campaigns to use this technology to better reach out to the voters, to spread their campaign materials, and to provide some more information, especially if they're underfunded, you know, it really kind of helps to feed into the democratic values and institutions. There, was, there were two great examples that come, came to my mind, was in Pakistan, during Imran Khan was jailed, the man AI helped to bring, bring it to the voters, and in some countries which are less democratic, they created the AI chatbots where, without being, you know, in danger of responding, you know, uh, to the pop popular questions, uh, it was a chatbot which could do that. So kind of really relating and bringing the democratic values up, up the chain and making it more accessible. Well, th thank, thank you. you for saying that, because we, we, we will probably spend most of our time on, on in fact, the threats, <laughs> but but we do need to also spend some time on the, re as, it says, as, as in our panel um, uh, title, in the remedies and, and, and more positive aspects. Because it, it is certainly not all negative. So thank, thank you, you for that. Uh, Petra Petra Kunkel, if you could introduce yourself and, and perhaps Perfect. a little bit of your work. Perfectly, all right. And and yes, I, I understand there's another panel on AI for good. So maybe, yeah, we need to talk, we need to have this topic, but maybe we should concentrate on the, you know, on the threats and the, yeah, and possibly remedies. So my background is I'm an executive committee member of the International Club of Rome. I'm also the founder and uh, today honorary president of the Collective Leadership Institute. And that's my main expertise because it is about leading collectively when we talk about transformative change. And that needs to take place at all levels. And I've been doing this for um, decades and also develop methodologies that really help people across the world uh, to tackle issues that are challenging in multi-stakeholder processes. I've been probably at the at the pioneering, participating or not actually advising the pioneering multi-stakeholder processes on standard development for sustainable supply chains. Uh, but I'm particularly interested in this topic because, because of the fact that we do have multi-stakeholder collaboration today established as a means of working together across, you know, you've, John, you mentioned it, across governments, companies, etc., and civil society. Uh, it's actually helpful that that is already established because the threats of AI, the remedies, can only be done in multi-stakeholder collaboration. And I will concentrate on this a little bit more. So that is my general statement on AI is uh, huge threats, but threats in the context of power pathologies that we have in the world. And we need to be mindful that uh, the technology as such, similar to social media, never is the threat as such, but the way it's being used is the threat or that's how the threat develops. And um, that is kind of releasing um, technologies like artificial intelligence into a world of power pathologies, of course, can really go wrong. We know this. And so uh, in remedies, we definitely need to deal with power pathologies. 
Yes, I agree with you. <laughs> and, and thank you for that. Um, Glenn, uh, Glenn Gaffney, uh, perhaps you could introduce yourself and, and, and the work that you're engaged in uh, today. But a, li and a little bit of background, I think, uh, would be would be great also in your case, because I'm going to come back to you uh, once people understand uh, your history on, on a couple of things. <laughs> Okay, thanks, John. Um, I'm Glenn Gaffney. Um, I spent uh, 31 years um, in the U.S. intelligence community, um, almost all of those at the Central Intelligence Agency doing technical development um, and technical analysis, technical collection uh, against um, a, a wide variety of, uh, of threats. Um, I retired after 31 years. Part of my time there at CIA uh, was as the director of science and technology for the CIA for about six years. Um, I retired uh, after 31 years and I went into uh, the venture business. I was the uh, one of the executive vice presidents uh, at InQtel, which was a strategic investor in technology that had dual use, um, meaning that it was good for the economy uh, and uh, potentially important for national security for the U.S. and, and allies. Um, I, I helped develop and co-found a new, uh, new not-for-profit that eventually spun out of InQtel, um, and that, and that not-for-profit uh, partnered with another one called the Noble Reach Foundation, uh, where we are uh, focused on translating research and moving it forward into product and into new companies uh, that can really drive and sustain the next economy. Uh, really focused on uh, no tech too early uh, and what are the key things that we feel we need to be deliberate in and bringing those technologies forward. Um, and so that's uh, that's where uh, that's where I've most recently been serving uh, in the Noble Reach Foundation, uh, as well as uh, providing some technical consulting uh, in a number of different areas, uh, boards and what have you. Um, I think uh, my opening statement, I think, is um, is really about speed uh, and spread. Um, what I see that used to be. Uh, perhaps the sole purview of a handful of high-tech nation states um, in terms of the ability to develop uh, technologies and use technologies both in development and the, in the prosecution of things that uh, we would classify as deep fakes today, but also the technology for the detection uh, and understanding of those deep fakes. Um, that's all changed. Um, not only uh, is this technology uh, widespread, is easily affordable. Um, it, there's a low cost of entry into the business. It is incredibly good uh, in terms of the, the quality of it. Uh, the volume and the speed at which it has grown and continues to grow uh, is astounding. Um, just a year or so ago, um, we were talking in terms of measuring audio input for understanding and developing an audio model to be something in the order of you know hours of recording and then developing a model and then employing a model uh, uh, to imitate voice. Um, now we're talking seconds, uh, you know, le less or, or certainly minutes um, of recording. And for less than $10 a month for a subscription, and within a few uh, seconds, you can type things and have uh, people say what you want them to say. Um, the speed and the volume, it becomes a daunting task uh, for those who wish to authenticate, verify, and counter. Uh, and so I think this is a... a a huge task uh, that's before us, both technically, um, but from a leadership perspective, I'm so glad Petra's here and the work that she's doing. It's an area that uh, we're looking forward to chatting more about. Thank you very much, Glenn. And as I say, I, I, may, I think I may come back to you uh, shortly. Or, or, and you touched upon one of the key topics, which is, is uh, how do we know what we're seeing or hearing? And I'll, I'll come back to that. But Yvonne, we, we skipped over you. Um, if you're there, uh, it'd be great if you could uh, introduce yourself. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here exchanging uh, uh, our views on, on this important issue. Uh, I'm uh, the director in Prospectica, the European Institute for Future Studies and Strategy, and the deputy director at the Millennium Project, the uh, largest uh, futures network uh, worldwide uh, today. Uh, so it's more than uh, 70 nodes uh, uh, all around the world, uh, connecting local views with global views on what we call the global challenges. 
and one of them uh, it's right now this uh, technological disruption and um, very important for us the transition from what we call uh, current artificial narrow intelligence into future uh, artificial general intelligence. What we know about this uh, transition is that um, uh, we, we need to understand that uh, there are three kinds of artificial intelligence uh, levels uh, from narrow today, where we basically humans can tell robots and machines uh, what they should do. Uh, to a future artificial general intelligence where uh, this uh, artificial intelligence will have uh, the capacity to decide in its own uh, way and, and to make decisions uh, uh, in a capacity similar to, to humans. So uh, this general intelligence is expected to be able to address novel problems without pre-programming, uh, initiate uh, searches for information worldwide, use sensors and the Internet of Things to learn, uh, make phone calls and interview people, uh, and so on and so on. So the question is, um, AGI, this future AGI, will make the combination between organized crime, terrorism, uh, corruption, and information warfare uh, an illusion and making democracy and free markets uh, something that we may, uh, may lost in the, in the future. So if we don't get the initial conditions, rules and web rules uh, right for artificial general intelligence, then artificial super intelligence could evolve quickly beyond our understanding in the future. Uh, that's why the Millennium Project, uh, it's launching a two years uh, governance study uh, to understand this transition from narrow to general intelligence. What we are doing is we are reviewing uh, of, of others' research, conferences, and uh, internet searches as a starting point, currently analyzing interviews and comments by AGI thought leaders. Uh, results will shape an international real-time Delphi questionnaire. Uh, then we will follow with uh, uh, the, the idea to construct alternative scenarios of different global, global governance models. Its scenarios will be submitted to a second RTD Delphi uh, improvement. And finally, scenarios distributed and translated through the Millennium Project notes around the world. So that's uh, the whole idea, and we, we hope we can share uh, soon the uh, outcomes of this important uh, research on uh, future artificial general intelligence and the role this can uh, uh, make on on this uh, future of uh, disinformation and, and related threats. Uh, Ivan, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, it it, uh, it raises so many questions uh, and, and, and topics and, and we'll come back to some of them but at the very, very least, it, 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 it makes it clear we're only just getting started on this journey of, of understanding um, the power uh, of AI, both in its narrow form, uh, as we see today, and its more broad form that will develop um, over time uh, as, as AGI, which is, uh, which is very daunting to think all the way through. And, and uh, applaud you and the people involved trying to get a handle on that before, uh, before it's upon us. Um, and and we can only uh, be reactive at that point. So what what I'd like thank you everybody for introducing yourselves. What I'd like to do is, is start um, with with a few questions. I'll probably ask someone uh, to to be the first respondent, but I would 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 then love people just to c come in and and say what what they might uh, think about that to the, the the topic. Um, and we'll we'll get to both some of the uh, some of the the things that everyone touched upon uh, in their intros. Um, as as well as um, where this can all head, and as Ivan is uh, working so hard on. Um, so um, first off, the, the the World Economic Forum uh, in its report uh, for this year's uh, Economic Forum uh, in, in January uh, characterized uh, AI dis disinformation as the single largest threat facing uh, the planet today on the short term basis. Longer term, it identified climate change, but short term, uh, it identified AI uh, disinformation. With that in mind, and, and, and turning to you, Glenn, you spent um, a, a very large part of your career trying to understand truth in, in uncertain conditions and trying to determine uh, in your intelligence work what 
what uh, how to actually discern truth. Do you feel any of that bears on the general issues that that the world at large now has to think about in trying to understand what truth is in this in this now age of AI and disinformation? Uh, um, well, the short answer is yes. I absolutely believe uh, it, it has that. It, it um, believe that concern is very real and appropriate. Um, we are so hardwired to believe what we see, um, mm. believe what we hear. Um, we are hardwired to not believe that we've been had. Mm. Um, it, it's just human nature. And um, one of the things that um, I think is important in this space is, uh, you know, quickly we're seeing and hearing these new, these models, these AI uh, models are generating audio and video that it is harder and harder to distinguish, um, you know, by the eye or by the ear, any difference. Um, let alone, you know, other methods of information uh, that we are receiving. And we have to also remember that it doesn't matter if it's necessarily true or not, or even after the fact, if you've learned that it was uh, digital, it, it was created by a machine. Once you've seen it, there's an impact there, right? Um, and so one of the things and I think this is, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into some of this uh, in talking about standards and norms and, and what have you, but um, one of the things that I think is really important in this space, not just on the technical side and how we might use AI to actually help us in this matter, but I think there's a whole educational piece here that's absolutely critical that, that we'll need to start at some of the earliest ages in the way that we educate folks to engage in this new world of information. Um, one of the questions that as an intelligence analyst, we ask ourselves all the time is, is this information given with the intent to influence? Right. Um, how do I think about the information I'm receiving and who might be trying to influence me through the reception of this information? And it goes to this idea of a confidence factor and how we think about uncertainty and how we think about multiple source authentication around what we're seeing and what we're hearing. Um, <clears throat> teaching and developing both the current de generation and the next generation about how to live, operate, right, um, and use information in this space is very different from the way that we learned it in the past or applied it and necessarily applied it in the past. And the speed at which we need to do these things um, uh, is going to matter greatly. Uh, and that's where you, that's where I think we start to bring in some of the technology, uh, new technology into the space. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Glenn. And maybe uh, throw it open to everyone. Uh, but maybe Petra, uh, in in the work that that uh, that you do, and 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 in the circles that you travel, is there a real effort being undertaken um, uh, and around media literacy, which is I think part of what you're, you're talking is a phrase that you know could come from what you were saying, Glenn. Though that seems a little soft, frankly, compared to the the ac actually what's needed. But but we have to start somewhere. So um, have you seen, you know, real efforts being uh, organized around media literacy and maybe even on the same question, uh, you know, in, in different parts of the world? Because I think that that's at least a precursor to understanding and having some ability to discern what might be more truthful uh, um, bits of information, let's say. Um, honestly, if at all, not enough. I do hmm. think that is definitely something um, for the future and that is something where we need to put priority to the what you call media literacy you know that that is but, but I do think it's more it is not just media literacy for for citizens I do think that is extremely important and we really need to you know, we are already at the remedies. <laughs> yeah, we, we really, really need programs around that. But it, it's a little bit more where we actually need to think about it. And Glenn, you were saying, um, you were mentioning something, you know, that I find extremely important. It is the combination of AI, a kind of the bad intention AI, you know, like, of course, AI has uh, very good sites, but the bad intention AI. 
And and the human factor, you know, you said we believe what we see. That's exactly the case. So it means that um, uh, just to give an example, there is a there, at the moment there there was a couple of months ago there was a deep fake in Germany um, that um, the Green Party is not going to allow individual homes anymore. Yeah, so people need to kind of move out of their individual homes because it is against uh, you know kind of CO two footage or you know, of course, total nonsense. But somebody has said something at some stage, a minister, that individual homes create more CO2, um, you know, kind of emissions than um, kind of joint homes. So now imagine you have a video of this minister saying exactly that. You know, how much this confuses people, because it would even confuse members of the Green Party in Germany. They say, you know, it can't be possible, but then, you know, it, it looks as if it's possible. So we, we, we meet AI with the human factor that we are, that we are used in real life. I'm not talking about virtual. We are used in real life that somebody says something and we hear it and we see the face to it. And now we've moved to Zoom as we are in Zoom. And the, at the moment, we all believe that, um, you know, you believe that I'm talking. <laughs> I am talking what I'm, I'm saying, what I'm saying here. But we don't know, you know, with AI, we don't know anymore. And so this means that um, there is a huge um, confidence and trust issue. And that isn't that 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 could be partly, of course, um, counteracted, you know, by good media literacy. But there is a question mark that we need to put that also goes particularly to big media houses and to to the any kind of journal journalism, because good journalism, of course, you know, checks sources and origins and uh, lots of stuff and you know would probably also use an AI technology to detect uh, fake videos. Uh, however, uh, there, there is really a, a moment where we have a big question mark on what and how journalism, how journalism can work and um, where the rule is don't believe anything. And, you know, I mean, imagine, you know, that, that, that is the rule. Don't believe anything unless you have a confirmation of, uh, I don't know, so many other people. So and that brings me to to the uh, to the issue that um, the human factor is extremely important. And then now if you combine um, bad intention AI with social media and social media, particularly anything that's on the smartphone, um, is working, you know, on a very personalized way. So you get messages sent from people that you generally trust. I also sometimes get messages sent from people where I say, are you? you're crazy. Yeah. And then I sent a message back and say, don't I stop this nonsense. But generally you would trust your surroundings, your, your personalized relationships. And, and that of course gives a, an added value, kind of a negative, but you know, an added value to the deep fake videos that you might see or the, or the messages, etc. And I do think that is a, a development where we honestly don't have answers at the moment. The only answer that I can come up with, kind of in my experience, and that uh, many, many people, of course, support, is you need to counteract uh, the virtual reality with the offline, with the real reality, you know, with real um, relationships, with getting on the phone, uh, trying to get information, you know, having networks, having people working together so that you can easily check, you know, I've, I found this, have you also found this? What do you think about it? Uh, where are the origins do you know? And so we need a um, a way, particularly in the media, of global working together, global networks that can quickly um, check what is happening and help people. And, and that we need that at the scale. I think we can't even imagine today. But that is, you know. So my 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 message is really. Yes, it is about media literacy and we need to and, and all countries need to take this seriously. And I don't think people really take it as serious as they um, need to. Uh, but it's not just about education. It is also about um, building a net a counteractive network and, and particularly in the media world. Yes, I, I think but what, what you and Glenn have said, it's so important that we're, we're so used to as humans relying on our senses what we see, what we hear, and, and and obviously believing them, and and this this challenges that very very fully. 
And also, uh, Petra, you, you touched upon one of the areas I spend a, a lot of time on myself, which is the confluence of AI with social networking, mm -hmm. which also which goes to the, the rapid spread of, of, of this, this kind of disinformation in this case before anyone can even figure out what the countermeasure might be. It's all, it already can spread literally a, around the globe. Um, so I, I wonder if, any, if anybody else wants to comment on, on what, and I use the term media literacy because I'm not sure we have a better term at this time. It seems, again, it seems much too, um, much too soft to me, a term for what is actually needed. But, but anything they're seeing uh, in terms of organization, get, getting programs in place that could make a difference uh, to counteract the spread and to get people educated around, around these issues, if, if anybody else is seeing that. Can, can I continue? Yes, please. John? Yeah, yes, please. Just, uh, following uh, Glenn's and Petra's uh, points, uh, uh, I, I was remembering that uh, last year in September, I was invited by the European College of Intelligence. Uh, I don't know if, if you have ever heard of this. It's the network of intelligence services in Europe that uh, President Macron created in 2019. Uh, so it's it's a network where they meet uh, every every year to discuss uh, big uh, issues related to security and to strengthen cooperation. So in that meeting in Madrid, they uh, agreed that uh, especially this year in 2024, disinformation and disinformation related to AI is the uh, for sure the largest threat for security at least in Europe, if if not to say in the world considering that we have two big uh, political elections this, this year. And I remember that especially the, the German representative was mentioning this as, as being uh, the, their highest priority on, on, on what they are following on in, 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 in their security research. Uh, because, uh, of course, there is a big threat that, that uh, many countries like Germany will be um, affected by, by uh, this kind of disinformation attacks uh, this year, and especially in the time from now to, to June, to the European European elections. So starting from, from that, um, well, uh, this is, of course, very much related to AI, because AI uh, is an uh, enabler for, for this, this disinformation. And uh, we know already narrow AI uh, uh, helps uh, increase this this disinformation disinformation attacks to, to to different countries. So the point is, what could happen in the in the near future when we transition from the current uh, uh, narrow AI into a general AI that would have uh, some capacities that we are not even able to to understand or or, or see uh, right now. Uh, so this is why we we are uh, repeating that it's very important that we start thinking on how to design this this transition, and especially uh, uh, from the point of view of the governance. Uh, many times it is argued that uh, creating rules for governance uh, for different issues, for uh, AGI, for instance, too soon uh, will limit uh, its development from the technological point of view. Some AGI experts believe uh, it is uh, possible to have AGI as soon as in five to 10 years. We are not talking about 20 years or 30 years. We are talking about this decade. Uh, so since it is likely to take that long to develop uh, 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 narrow to uh, general international agreements, design an international governance system and begin implementation, if, if we take into account all this, then it is wise to begin exploring global governance approaches now. This is our, our big highlight. We need to start international cooperation on the design of these uh, governance models uh, uh, based on uh, clear standards and values that we need to agree, like in many other uh, aspects of security. Uh, this happened uh, 60 years ago when we were discussing about uh, atomic energy and humanity decided to create the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, probably today we need to go further because uh, AGI will be much more complex than, than atomic energy. Uh, so, so let's start this conversation now 
and we really need to a little bit to run on on this issue because uh, AGI and AI, which is a huge opportunity for humanity, AI could save lives, uh, but it could, on the other hand, uh, be a big threat for for humanity, especially for political systems. So let's try to get the best out of AI and try to reduce these uh, these threats uh, uh, as much as, as possible. So Ivan, you you, ra you raised the, the, the topic of, of um, regulation guidelines and obviously it's a very important topic. So what I'd like to do is perhaps ask um, uh, each of us who we think w uh, should be the relevant bodies in this regard. Is it is it, you know, is it the UN? Is it uh, you know, is it the EU? You know, is it not, not NGOs? Is it consortiums of, of the companies involved or, or all of the above? What do we think could be most effective in this regard? I'll go th through each. So, again, I apologize in pronunciation, but um, uh, Ratha, perhaps you could you could lead us in that and, and, and any viewpoint you may have around the right places for, for regulation and standards to be implemented. Absolutely. No, thanks, John. And thanks for great um, uh, insights from all fellow panelists. And uh, following on Ivan's kind of call for action for the global governance, I think, uh, and for and answering your question, John, but I think it's extremely important that the AI governance is not dominated by the global minority, right? So let's not repeat the mistakes that we've done previously when we're you know, kind of we're not considering the needs of the global south, of the underrepresented communities, etc., which now we can see are, you know, we see the results of that bit with the big movements like environmental justice from the climate perspective, et cetera. With AI, especially being a data-driven concept, we need to make sure that the global inequalities are not in that imbalanced risk. And in order to do that, when we think about just the 40%, if I'm not mistaken, of the large language models are designed in the US. You know, and then I think more than 80% are, you know, in the global north, let's say, some of the global south faces some very unique uh, difficulties and challenges in developing and utilizing the ai for example there's limited just access to the electricity you know just to go to the internet and train the data there is the compilation resources there is not much of the inf uh, digital infrastructure which is there so a lot of people the workforce that we see you know in africa especially in india who are trained a bit more in the ai they are leaving the country you know for much better paid world they have much more big, lucrative opportunities so i think kind of keeping that uh, and at the same time giving maybe from the ai perspective from the llm sorry large language models perspective sometimes they just do not work in the global south so maybe moving to the smaller language models which take into consideration the local specificities uh, is even better, takes a bit less resources. But I think one other thing to focus on is the fact that we already have seen the results that the AI is not the best judge, right? So especially when it comes to the disinformation, when it comes to making decisions, it can be racist. We've seen the open AI, I think already accepted that AI tools can be racist in many, many places. But uh, most importantly, uh, John, answering your question, right? I think it's really important to bring the governments in, giving these opportunities, having the accessibility and openness to the governments, to the teams on the ground, to be able to train those models, you know, lar large language models, to put the data in, but at the same time, preventing the risk of too much putting the data there so to harm the privacy. You know, if you put too much data of all the, you know, uh, characteristics of the consumers or the cultural bits and bobs of things into the AI data set, it can actually bring some insights which very easily could be commercialized by the big tech, big, you know, capitalist companies, and at the same time used for the wrong reasons during the election campaigns. So um, there are some positive changes in the global governance. I think it was during the Munich Security Conference that there was a big top 20 tech uh, the tech companies, including Microsoft, OpenAI, TikTok, made a pledge to work together. I think it's called the AI Elections um, Pledge, uh, Elections Accord. Uh, Accord. And uh, I think the basis is there for the first start. But then it's very important to keep not only, especially as we come to the you know global governance of AI and AGI, as one mentioned, to make sure that it's not just the you know big tech driven or global north driven governance in the future. 
It's 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 a very important uh, point you raise, uh, um, and also you know I, I wonder how, you know with the with a lot of the companies, the large companies being in the United States, um, how much they you know how much power they want to cede, frankly, to uh, you know and to whom. It'll be an interesting question because uh, the, the need for regulation, at least to me, is is clear, and that regulation does have to be global standards in order to be effective. So it will be interesting tension uh, to see how that works out. Petra, maybe same question. I'm going to go around to everybody. Same question to you. Where, where, where should the government, the governance and the standards uh, emanate from? Uh, I think it needs to be global. Uh, yet at the same time, it also needs to be national. And um, I, I, I need to make the comparison. Uh, that sounds a bit strange, but I, I think countries need to understand that safeguarding the impact of disinformation is like safeguarding borders. That sounds a bit strange, particularly if I now mention the EU, because the EU is um, horrible in terms of borders. Um, it is, if it comes to the regulatory approaches, according to the experts that I've asked, uh, indeed the front runner. I don't know if anybody else knows knows um, what, what is happening in the rest of the world. Um, no, not in the rest of the world, but in most of the world, because it's absolutely right that Europe is just a tiny fraction of the world. Um, but what is interesting, uh, the, the EU actually, number one, and these are just the beginnings of the beginnings, has a code of practice on disinformation. It's a voluntary code, but all the big companies, the big tech companies are uh, have joined. Uh, that is, uh, I think, quite interesting. But uh, as I said, it's a voluntary code. So um, it, it's a good way to go. But uh, of course, one needs more. And of course, as you probably know, the, the EU has the Digital Operational Resilience Act for the financial sector, which is also a, a stepping stone in the area. And then the, what is called um, the Cybersecurity NIS2 Directive. And I do think um, the move of the European Union, particularly as it includes a lot of countries, is a good move. But I also agree that it's not about Europe uh, determining the path. You know, it's like you can be a front runner, uh, great, but you you can probably learn from other countries or other countries can learn from the EU, but not in terms of domination, but in terms of, uh, as I said, it's it's an issue where the technological development is so fast that the regulatory approach will always be too slow, but we have to speed up the regulatory approach, you know, by really very open and joint learning. And just to give an example, you know, where uh, where this is such a huge challenge in terms of regulation, is that the the what, what I consider the one of the most important uh, threats is you know what you can call bad actors, you know, bad state actors, yeah, because we have states where the, the bad intention AI is used for manipulation of other countries or destabilization, destabilization of other countries. And this kind of um, state financed um, uh, kind of disinformation is really kind of very well financed, you know, and, and, and they're in that very powerful. And there is a bit of a race, a technological race of developing detection um, technology and developing technology that can avoid detection, you know, that, that, and this race is going to go on for the next uh, couple of years. And I do believe it's probably getting worse before it gets better. But the, the, the issue here is that um, we need to uh, push for the regulatory approaches and um, the European Union can just be a uh, an example, you know, but uh, there need to be more countries getting together. And finally, of course, um, I believe, um, John, you were mentioned that it probably requires a, a global body, you know, kind of an international body uh, that is uh, handling these issues. Yes, thank you. Um, Glenn, uh, again, same question. Where, if, where, where, where should the standards and the regulation emanate from? So um, I agree with everything that's been, been said so far. And I want to pick up on Petra's point um, that I think there's a there's a local piece to this, there's a regional piece to this, and there's a global piece to this because we're not, we're not uniform, <laughs> right, um, as people, right? Uh, and, and information and influence is personal. 
And so we've got to, um, so th there's, a, there's a local aspect to it. There's a regional aspect to it. There's a global aspect to it. And, and, and Raza's point um, about the global South and, and their participation, I think, is really important in this. And they're, they should not be ignored, uh, number one. Number two, um, as we're thinking about some of the key things like the future of infrastructure and the establishment of some of that digital infrastructure across the global South, there's opportunity to actually build some things in by design um, that the rest of us are trying to bolt on after the fact. Um, and so the the insight and the insight that we will get from participation from the global south, as well as this local and regional approach, may actually inform us and help us be more creative in the things that we're trying to uh, adjust and, and affect in this in this other area. So I think those were those were both really um, uh, strong points. I think. Um, Yes, I, I, I think um, organizations uh, like the ones that are represented uh, here in this panel, but also um, the UN, um, NATO, um, places that are, I think every, every um, international uh, decision group, right, uh, that has the opportunity or has a view on standards and norms, right, uh, should be taking up this question uh, around this around this whole area, um, and I would include things like we talked about news, right? Uh, news agencies, and we talked about the um, uh, the ability that the 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 need for a certain amount of dependence and corroboration, right? In that space, what does it look like if news agencies are um, focused on being right more than they're focused on being first? Um, and how does that change the way that um, we actually validate and verify things in that space? What does it mean for the venture capital community? This is one of the things I've charged some of my venture capital colleagues with in the, in the past. Um, when you're looking at a new technology that has great creative potential, like some of these um, AI models that are helping with things like voice to give voice to folks who uh, medically um, uh, either surgically or from a disease, lose their voice. They can continue to have their voice, right? And in, in a positive application of what would otherwise be classified as a deep fake, um, there's a very humanitarian piece to this. When a company is pitching a, us uh, uh, from an investment perspective with a really good and creative and positive use case, asking the question, all right, have you thought about how this would be used right, in a negative context, and what are the things that actually might be used to help detect or otherwise counter these pieces? I think it's a rational question for venture folks, folks who are making an investment and propelling this technology forward. They're reasonable questions to ask, and um, from my standpoint, if I'm, if I'm coming up against or if I'm looking at a CEO or listening to a CEO who hasn't thought about it at all, uh, that is just putting it out there, um, I've got some. Uh, I've got some secondary questions I want to think through before I make the investment. Yeah. You said that nicely, but I think those those que those would be the uh, the questions that would come to mind right away at this point uh, for any any investment decision. They should, and and, and they, they should, and and I think you raised a really interesting um, point uh, um, that by going by by involving the. the let's call it not only the global south, but the globe more, more broadly, there are a lot of territories, areas where this can be done from the ground up, perhaps in a right in, a, in the right way versus a retrofit to some already existing systems and so on that may, ex that may exist uh, today in other, in other pl more so-called more developed places. And that that's an interesting opportunity for everyone uh, uh, globally to see if that, you know, to see how that can be implemented rather than just a retrofit. Um, very interesting. Now, Yvonne, I'm going to say I'm going to go to the same question with you, and I think you know you have a very um, particular kind of uh, frame that that's that that it's not only you're not only looking at today and the issues that are right in front of us uh, with with narrow uh, AI, but also uh, but also uh, artificial uh, sorry general uh, general intelligence. Um, so, with that in mind, you know. We're, we're, how do we begin to think about the regulatory framework and standards framework that will lead us into that future? 
Yes, first of all, I, I agree with my panelists, my, with my colleagues, that uh, we need both uh, a global approach, but also to take into account uh, regional views on, on this, because we have different uh, cultures, we have different values, and uh, uh, we are repeating, and many experts are saying we need values for, for AI, uh, but, but the question is what values? How do we how do we agree on the values we want for this AI? Not only for the for today's AI, but also for future AI. Uh, so in in the Millennium Project, we have been uh, analyzing different models, concrete uh, governance and regulatory models for not only for today's AI, but also for future AI. We have assessed uh, the limits and and uh, possibilities of the different approaches. Uh, because we already have examples in other technologies in 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 in, in today's world. Uh, for instance, the International Agency uh, Atomic Energy Agency like model or the World Trade Organization like uh, model with enfor enforcement powers. Uh, these are the easiest uh, to understand, but likely to be too static to manage uh, not a narrow AI but future artificial general intelligence. Another case, uh, IPCC for climate change, IPCC-like model in concert with international treaties. Uh, this approach has not led uh, to a governance system for climate change. So why it should uh, work for AI? Um, so we, we need to see these limits. Uh, international Science and Technology Organization as an online real-time global collective intelligence system. Uh, governance by information power. This would be useful to help select and use an AGI system, but no proof that information power would be sufficient to govern the evolution of AGI. We have another example. The Global Governance Coordinating Committees would be flexible and enforced by national sanctions, ad hoc legal uh, ruling in different countries, and insurance uh, premiums. This has too many ways to AGI developers to avoid meeting uh, those standards. UN, ISO, and or IEEE standards used to, for auditing and licensing. Licensing would affect uh, purchases and would have impact, but requires international agreement of all countries ratifying. Or put different parts of AGI governance under different bodies like ITU, uh, World Trade Organization, and others. Some of this is likely uh, to happen, but this is not sufficient to govern all instances of AGI systems. So uh, last but not least, we think that this could be the best uh, uh, right now, a decentralized semi-autonomous trans institution. This could be the most effective, but the most difficult to establish since both decentralized semi-autonomous organizations and trans institutions are new concepts. Uh, and of mm. course, we consider the Millennium Project to be also a trans institution that needs to uh, create a, a cooperation between different governments, corporations, uh, academia, research world, and so on. So the point is, Let's uh, start uh, now to create this cooperation on different uh, alternatives for this to for designing these these governance models, and let's keep in mind that we need not only to address current AI but future artificial general intelligence. Uh, and last, uh, I would like to say that my colleagues uh, Mariana Todorova and uh, our CEO Jerome Glenn will be speaking on this also tomorrow in another session of this uh, conference. And and, and, it, and it will require more than a few sessions to to get from here to yes. there uh, in terms of the governance. So so that's good. That's very good. Now I wanted to um, and thank you all for that. I wanted to sort of take almost a counterpoint. Um, a presumption of this panel, and I would I would say my own feelings are, if anything, we we perhaps have understated the the threat uh, of AI and disinformation, particularly because, as I started, this is uh, the largest election year in the history of the planet. But um, I wanted to see if there was a counterpoint to that, so I went back to uh, to CLI AI and I asked the following question: um, is the threat from AI-based disinformation overstated in most policy and political discourse? The answer I got was, while AI-based disinformation represents a growing concern to the extent of, and an existing threat, 
it may be nuanced. The, the effectiveness of AI is not absolute. And there are increasing efforts to investigate its impact. Therefore, while the threat is real, it may be overstated in some policy discourse without considering the broader context and the efficiency and effectiveness of countermeasures. So it's a very balanced response in terms of saying perhaps it's it's not all as bad as we think, um, or some of us think, I should say, uh, and that there will be effective, as it said here, countermeasures uh, put in place. So I, I'd, I'd be interested in terms of each of you and, and kind of how optimistic you are about the ability for the world to react to, to in, the, in the ways that may be needed here. And perhaps we can go back through. Um, Raza, uh, would, you, would you mind starting us off on that one? Thanks, John. And I really like the we'll, responses we'll... that you've been, you've been asking and getting. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think, you know, AI is kind of, well, when I, when I talk to the engineers and I say that AI is new, they say, no, come on, machine learning has been there for, for, for ages, right? But uh, when I look at it from the, I think uh, what Glenn mentioned, the spread and the speed, I think you mentioned, right? That's something which is really new and scary. There has there have always been bad people out there who, be it their AI, be no AI, um, they were trying to either get taken advantage, change the you know pathway on various levels. There was a very interesting question by Hitasha Kothari about how do we identify the on an individual level the AI disinformation, and the moment when it touches you, I mean when it touches the governments, you know, and being popularized by you know recent fake news awareness, uh, it is a bit different. It's far away. I have some friends. Who, I live in London, who are here, uh, Ukrainian refugees, and their mothers, their kids are in Ukraine, right, fighting in the war front. They received the voice call from their sons asking for money, saying, Mom, mother, I need money right now because I need to, you know, I'm starving. And it wasn't them. So what does the mother do, right? So do you call back that number? You don't have it. So we're living in a very polarized, very dangerous world. And bad people will always try to take advantage of that on various levels, with regional elections, et cetera. So I think uh, what um, Pet Petra was saying about, you know, the trust, you know, don't, do not trust almost, you know, if you trust, check and then trust, I think it's very important, you know. It is sad, but it's important that as we're going forward with the AI, with the overall new world, which is more divided than ever, and it's much easier to fake stuff. We just need to uh, you know, manage our trust levels and you know being impressionable with the fact finding and really focusing on the objective, covered from different angles, not you know systemic historically just one angled truth, but objective truth. Petra, are we are we overreacting? Is the threat overstated from AI and, and disinformation? No, I don't think it's overstated. I think it's um, really dangerous, and particularly in the context of what I said, you know, bad actors. There could be individual bad actors, there could be terrorists, there could be state bad actors, or there could be simply a party, you know, that wants to uh, gain, uh, gain yeah, votes. Uh, I don't think we overreact. Um, in, the, in the southern... African region, uh, you can meet people who say uh, where the disease is, is also the remedy growing, you know, like in terms of herbs. Mm -hmm. And um, I find, I've always found this kind of, <laughs> you know, maybe not not being naive, you know, not soothing, but uh, but I do think the the only remedy is, is people, is kind of the human factor. That's, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not um, saying we don't need regulations. We do need regulations. But in order to have the regulations fast enough across the world, it also needs human beings organizing that. Uh, but I, I also want to uh, to um, highlight one other point, you know, that, that easily gets forgotten. It is about creating vast networks and alliances because we can learn from multi-stakeholder collaboration in uh, sustainable value chains or in um, ocean acidification or in, in all the other challenges that we have in climate change, etc., that there are lots of different organizations already working in the right direction. And we do have, just to name a few, the International Fact-Checking Network, we have the Global Coalition on Digital Safety, we have the Global Network on Extreme 
extremism and technology, the Coalition for Content and Provenance and Authenticity. We have the Global Dis Disinformation Index, the Alliance for Security Democracy. By the way, they have just um, uh, published a report uh, giving examples around Europe where people can learn from each other. Uh, one among them is media literacy uh, education in, in Estonia. So we have a lot of different kind of foundations, alliances, networks, etc., that you could uh, say are part of civil society. And um, imagine they get together and uh, imagine you get this knowledge together and also the work that they do in terms of tracking truth yeah? so or tracking fake news. Um, I think a lot can be done. And, and these are just a few. I'm, I'm sure there are many more. So it, it's really about people getting together in terms of networks and alliance alliances and imagine am i like <laughs> let's dream of a future imagine i get a video sent by um this green minister saying uh no individual houses are now forbidden you know you need to kind of demolish them yeah so and it's a real video you know and imagine that this comes from a friend of mine in a in a whatsapp um message and and with this message came a note this is an AI created video. Don't trust it. It may not be true. Yes, I mean, like I'm, I'm just dreaming of a technology, but, but um, I'm saying I do think we have the capability of dealing with the issue in a different way. But just to uh, go back to what I've said in the beginning, um, there, there is something that we need to address in this world, and that's not only AI relevant, and that is really huge power pathologies. We have a rise of authoritarianism. And in this rise of authoritarianism, we implemented technology. And Glenn, you were saying, you know, in terms of responsibilities of CEO, think twice before you do this. Um, uh, we, we, without addressing and really naming these power pathologies, what as of what they are, you know, and not just kind of legitimizing any kind of um, governance. Uh, without doing that, we're not getting going to get anywhere so but if we want to get there we need to network and um get different alliances together yeah i i, th I think again the, the the confluence of let's 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 add dude i was saying ai and social social media and now with the also the confluence the rise of, of kind of more authoritarian uh tendencies in various places is a is a is a mix we have to be very wary of in my opinion uh, and, and we have not seen before but again, I, I don't want to prejudice anyone's answers. Um, Iban, do, do you feel we, we're, we're um, we in the World Economic Forum, for that matter, are overstating uh, the threat uh, in, here that the AI and dif disinformation represents? No, uh, I think I think this is really a, a huge threat and a huge opportunity. Also, uh, I mean, uh, it's probably the largest challenge humanity is facing for the next decades uh, in in the context of this AI transition. Uh, we have big challenges, as we know, also related to climate change, related to uh, inequalities worldwide, related to uh, social uh, instability and, and, and so on. Uh, but uh, I think this, this uh, combination of the transition of uh, narrow AI into general AI in the framework of a disinformation context, it's, it's really a, a huge thing. But as, as my colleagues mentioned, uh, we are on time. Uh, we, we, it's, it's a matter of us. We can, we can address this, this huge challenge if, if we really want. But it, uh, of course, requires a, a big, a, a big uh, coordination approach uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, it's not about uh, two leading countries agreeing on this. We really need a, a global multilateral uh, approach to, to get in a, 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 an, an agreement on, on this. And of course, understanding the complexity. We are not talking about a very concrete, simple issue. We are uh, talking about a very complex issue that it's very difficult to, to address. And we need to anticipate how this could evolve in 10 years, in 15 years, in 20 years, in order to design a governance model that will be uh, will be uh, effective to 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 address the the challenge uh, 
uh, effectively. So um, I think there is a big opportunity, like it, it was mentioned in the previous session, uh, with this new framework, this new U UN uh, framework called uh, our common agenda and the summit of the future that we will be celebrating in September. This is a big opportunity. We have never seen uh, uh, such a clear approach into futures thinking by the UN until now. Uh, so this opens a, a big opportunity, but of course we need the, uh, the, the contribution by the member states and the willingness by the member states to somehow to uh, miss uh, or, or to uh, get uh, less uh, power from, from national states and, and more coordination at the multilateral uh, level. Uh, in order to get a, a very good agreement to start with this uh, new governance system. Good, uh, thank you. And and so, Glenn, uh, to you, um, are we are we overreacting? Um, I don't think we're. Uh, so no, we're not. Um, uh, and I don't think it's overstated. I think um, <clears throat> there's certainly, um, as we're talking about general AI and the advent of general AI, and, and it's coming um, faster than a lot of folks think, um, I think there are things that we can be doing and should be doing now to be to prepare for that. Um, and we can use some of the AI models uh, that have been that are in development and have been developed uh, today. Uh, I'm a big believer in not taking the human out of the loop when the human was the reason for the loop in the first place. Um, and I believe that is it, alongside of international or global standards and norms, there also should be um, at, at probably local, regional uh, and global sharing um, <clears throat> a series of what I, uh, what I call um, proving grounds where we are taking specific use cases and looking at not just the technical aspects of the AI, but the social impact, right? Um, because the decision that the AI, that the, that the machine makes, uh, the users are everybody who's gonna be affected by that machine. So we need to start integrating the, the social sciences research, right? And that local dimension in with the technical research and the application around real use cases, so that we understand what the tolerance is for risk right in this space and, and the way these things develop uh, and the way we think they should develop. Um, having the machine recognize that a human is in the loop, I think is one of the key things that needs to be developed as we, as we push these things forward. In the near term though, I don't think we're overstating the, the threat based on the disinformation and disinformation opportunities that are out there um, because it is wide scale. It is rampant. Yes, fraud, fraud is dominating the space right now, um, but it is growing in, in other areas of influence and, and um, influence operations, uh, which is a which is a valid, uh, a, a significantly valid concern. I think um, the other piece that strikes me is, you know, uh, in many ways, we have never been more connected as human beings and we've never been more isolated at the same time. Uh, and when I talk to folks and I talk about and, and I'm the sheer level of distrust that exists um, uh, uh, begins to tear at the fabric of society. Uh, and and so uh, I really see this as a human issue, not a American or yeah. European or right. This is a human issue. Um, and and um, just like Yipan said earlier, um, the same way we thought we think about this relative to the safety and security of the planet relative to nukes, we need to be thinking about this as a human issue, right, globally. Um, and so, no, I don't think we're overstating or overreacting. Um, all that said, um, and and if we had time, I could get perhaps even a little scarier, all right, projecting out into the future. But I don't want to just focus on the scary part. I think um, I want to come back to something that Raza said earlier, which is there's positive applications here. And I think in this space, we need to actually think about using AI on AI. <laughs> the speed and the complexity of the way the disinformation and created content is going to be coming at us means that we're going to need to use AI for what it's good at, which is helping humans deal with the speed and the complexity of machine to machine, you know, communication and presentation and all of these things. So 
you know, I, I think there's already work going on where you can verify people like us on a portal before you go into the Zoom meeting to keep from happening what happened, right, uh, back in January or February or whenever that happened. But um, the and so there, there are applications that are being developed to begin to address these things. And I'll give you an example of one that I don't know that exists, but I think uh, uh, research should be done uh, uh, potentially in this space. But if you think about all the research that's been done in the AI work that's been done in modeling us in terms of our digital interests and our digital likes, right? why is it that advertising agencies know the words to push to me in that text message, right? That that uh, that uh, Petra was talking about, or um, present a, a story to me in a way that I'm more likely to follow it, right? We've developed these, these companies, the, uh, the tech community has developed engines that know me enough that they know how I'm going to act and react into that space. That's an influence, right, paradigm. But if a machine can actually say, these are the things that are set up here, then I can also train a machine to look at all of the other pieces around it. In other words, what does the not me look like, right, in that space? Mm -hmm. What is a personal recommender for me in that space when, I, when I'm looking at something that it says, this is, right, targeted on brand for you or off brand for you, right, in this space? How do I begin to think about and see the full range of influence around a story? Can I begin to use AI to look at the other connections and influencers and those pieces? I think there's some really interesting work that's already begun in trying to map out influence networks, right, in this space and using AI to do that. But I think it, I think it could actually, if we flip the model and think about rather than trying to sell folks stuff, right, which we've gotten really good at, um, how do we actually employ those same techniques to understand what what influence triggers I might be um, overly sensitive to? I begin to create personal recommenders that can actually help us move things forward. Very interesting. And, and we're, we're, what I'd like to do is is, is give everyone a, a last word and, and an option, um, either to to uh, in, in one minute or less suggest something that we didn't cover that, that is an important topic. Uh, for us to all consider and perhaps we can we can figure out the follow-up or to answer a question that's very much on my mind and goes back to where i started that this year is the year of of the greatest number of elections in, in human history what's the most important thing that we can do short term to to positively affect the the that these elections will be free and fair and i'll just go back through um everybody Ivan, perhaps you could you could you could take that either either What's our best short-term thing that we can do this year? To or is there some other topic that that we haven't had a chance to touch upon that you'd like to make sure that we consider? Sure, as as you said, uh, this is a very very important key year for this issue. Uh, we have uh, two big elections in June and, and November, so uh, I'm sure uh, the as, as I mentioned, the the intelligence uh, community will be ready uh, to to uh, to address this this big. Uh, Big challenge they will they will have uh, and we will all have uh, in the next uh, in the next uh, few months. We have to as citizens we have to stay uh, very uh, very clear and very active on on trying to to avoid all these these uh, threats. And I think again there is a big opportunity in September. Uh, we have the summit of the future. Uh, many things will be discussed in that in that summit re related to climate change, related to uh, social situation. But of course, this should be another big issue. Uh, we have the opportunity to get a global consensus to to discuss a new governance system that uh, should be uh, start uh, started. Uh, uh, been discussed uh, now. This year is the is a great opportunity. So let's let's go for it. Great, um, Petra. Uh, either 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 aspect. I pick uh, I pick just uh, two things that I think are important. The one is transparency, transparency, transparency. Also, what Glenn said, you know, developing more and more, and this also goes to the media. Um, Glenn, you said, uh, I think this is an important sentence, sentence um, truth rather than speed. And so that's a huge challenge, but the media need to take up this challenge. And then the complete other um, thing that I say, uh, particularly this year, is create and reestablish human connection 
offline <laughs> talk <laughs> love uh, kind of be together check uh, talk about things and and just kind of create networks on the local level etc you know whatever wherever there is human connection the influence of social media and uh, therefore also the influence of ai gets less great thank you glenn so uh two things uh come to mind real quick one is um i think uh, standards for authentication on AI generated content, um, uh, watermarking uh, along those lines, I think is an important uh, step that, and it's, I think it's a potential near term step that could be taken. Um, and I also think there's an opportunity to create some kind of a new version of the underwriter laboratory uh, model. Uh, mm -hmm. The underwriter laboratory model came up to protect citizens from from you know, relative to dangers, uh, you know, posed by appliances and products and what have you. What's the what is the twenty first century uh, UL right international UL look like uh, mm -hmm. relative to AI? Very interesting, Raza. We're giving you the last word. Thanks, John. And I think I won't take much time because there's a lot of great ideas there. First of all, Glenn, thank you for great startup idea on, you know, the, kind of looking at the outer side rather than your side, I think, of the interests. Uh, two things, I think we are almost in mid mid the year. So if you look at the kind of first half of the year, quite a lot of elections happened there. And we didn't really see, well, a couple of the fake, deep fakes of, you know, President Modi and a couple of President Biden's, et cetera. But it hasn't been as bad i think you know the awareness is very very important uh together with transparency that petra mentioned but the awareness uh there was a very interesting um statistics by politico where uh one thing which i love there was that the percentage of people saying i would definitely figure out if it's generated by ai or not and the percentage of the people responding the rest of my countrymen bringing figuring out are able to figure out the difference between ai generated and not was at least 20% difference. So we can always say that it will never happen to us, but I think it's very important to raise the awareness within yourself and within the community that you know it is a, one of the biggest threats that um, we're having in the coming decades for, for the rest of our lives, as our panel panelists have mentioned. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone for participating in this. I think it's, I think it's been a really important discussion about a very important topic that will continue to um, be a, um, one of global concern, and we're just getting started with with not only the impact of it, but how to deal with it. So, so thank you, thank you, everyone.